So yesterday we uh, talked a bit about how the Turks were spooked away from attacking Malta because they covered a, uncovered a, f a false message <laughs> that had been planted by one of the Knights of St. John that uh, told them that the Admiral Andrea Doria was going to go and get them if they attacked Malta. <laughs> and they were sufficiently scared of him so as to not attack. Does anybody know of a, something else famous called the, uh, not necessarily human being, <laughs> called the Andrea Doria? No? Never heard of a, a shipwreck in the 1950s? It collided with, uh, it, somehow, it, I guess radar technology was still too primitive at the time. Uh, there was also heavy fog. And made two ships ended up colliding, literally colliding with each other at almost right angles. There was one ship, the Andrea Doria was traveling, it was like what triangles, was traveling in this direction. And another ship, the Stockholm, was traveling, uh, toward, oh, this, if the U.S. is here, it was traveling that way. The Stockholm was traveling towards Europe. And f for some reason, they were both, you know, they, at whatever angles they were at, they ended up colliding at right angles. So it's like the Stockholm was like a battering ram <laughs> that, to the Andrew Doria. But they got, most people survived it. It wasn't like the Titanic in which thousands of people died. But... It was uh, you know, a prominent ship that went down in that way, similar to the Titanic, but not exactly the same thing. But anyway, also called the Andrea Doria. So as a result of the Turks being spooked off, the uh, Council of Trent was able to continue uh, when Pope Julius III, whose reign we are currently studying, wanted it to. So in the 11th session, so we're now, we're now in session number 11, under the precedence of legates named by Julius III, the fathers of the council declared that it was resumed and lawfully assembled. On the first day of September, the 12th session was held to announce to the fathers that they would at once proceed to discuss the decree on the sacrament of the Eucharist. So now it's time to deal with Protestant heresies uh, on the Blessed Sacrament. So they were about to do that when an unexpected and bitter dispute threatened again to break off its continuance. So King Henry II of France, as I remember, Francis I has died and Henry II is now uh, the King of France. He had uh, sent troops into Italy with the help of his, one of his Italian allies, Ottavio Farnese. Remember that you know, Pope Paul III was a Farnese. Uh, so getting into Italian politics again, you know, we don't, we're not going to cover every Italian war that popes get involved in because one thing, no, the, the, the events are also similar in all of them. <laughs> you would never keep them straight. And they're really, as far as the you know, world history in general, and even the history of any given papacy, generally m many of them do not have any you know, tremendous effect. It's just one more thing that these, you know, Italian families get involved in. I mean, it is significant in as much as it shows that these popes, who were many of them were worldly people who were more concerned with you know, family politics in Italy than they were with governing the church, uh, reforming discipline, uh, you know, condemning heretics, and uh, putting forth definitions that make the faith clearer to people. Many of them were more concerned with that or with worse things, with just being worldly people that they were before they were elected or with, you know, or were engaged in nepotism which is you know, which was rampant in these centuries. Uh, so, you know, Italian families, one uh, pope belonging to Farnese family, uh, is you know, getting involved in another war. So the French flag then started began to fly over certain a uh, couple of French, uh, or, sorry, Italian cities. Uh, the emperor declared himself in favor of immediate and forceful measures for driving the French and their adherents out of Italy. So this one will cover, in, this particular conflict will cover because it, you know, this does have some interesting consequences. Uh, the, the, the King of France threatened to reestablish the pragmatic sanction, which had been abolished since the Concordat of Leo X and Francis I. So it's for things like this that were covered in this particular one because you know, the King of France has threatened to bring that back. We thought, we thought that was dead and buried. Well, apparently not. It's uh, being trotted out again, or it's, it's threatening to be reestablished if the King of France doesn't get his way. 
he had already issued an edict ordering that no subsidy, whatever, should be sent to Rome, so forbidding anyone to send money to Rome for the support of the church, because he urged the Pope, by entering upon an unjust system of hostility against the King of France, prevents the Gallican Church, one of the most important parts of the Universal Church, from assisting at the Council. So, the Gallicanism. French nationalism extending to their uh, ecclesiastical politics, as it were. Um, getting this idea that their part of the church is more important than anybody else's, because <laughs> it's French. <laughs> so the fathers of the council replied that the mission of the council was entirely foreign to the disputes which divided Christian princes, and that the neutrality observed at Trent was quite sufficient to guarantee the safety of the French bishops. So the reply is that we're not, we're not getting it. We have no desire to get involved in these politics. Uh, we just want to you know, make definitions on the blessed sacrament. We don't want to fight wars between Italian, Italian and princes and the French king. We're not. It's not our interest. We chose this town, Trent, because precisely because it was supposed to be neutral territory, mainly for the Protestants. But it also works here, giving safe place to the king of to, to the bishops of France, French bishops who are present at the council, preventing them from getting caught up in any fighting that might go on, because it's neutral territory. It's not supposed to be involved at all. But it seems the king of France still wants to drag the council into the, into the fray, or at least the people involved in it into the fray. So they, uh, they also pointed out that the reestablishment of the pragmatic sanction would be unworthy of the monarch who bears the title most Christian king. Yes, that's true, but uh, we see that getting nice titles doesn't do anything like give monarchs the charisma of infallibility to behave themselves. <laughs> see, Henry VIII was called the defender of the faith, which the English monarchs bear to this day. That didn't prevent him from going very badly off the rails. They told him that, of course, his predecessors had annulled it for excellent reasons, so it made no sense for him to put it back in. And they told him that uh, by pursuing the opposite course, in other words, of reestablishing it, that Henry would display a gratuitous hostility, which, and this must be understatement, would do little to honor his character. <laughs> in other words, he would make himself into a total villain by doing that, by reenacting basically persecutions against the church, persecution in some sense. Uh, but that reply did not have its intended uh, response. Uh, he, the king persisted in his resolve, and no French bishops appeared at the second period of the council. The fathers were not to be overcome by that opposition and rejected the Gallican doctrine, which claimed that by the mere absence of the French prelates, uh, that, the that the council lost its ecumenical character. <laughs> so, I mean, an ecumenical council has a, it means a general council. So they say, oh, French bishops are there, therefore it's not ecumenical anymore. The Gallican church is too important <laughs> for it to be considered ecumenical, a general council, if uh, the French bishops aren't there. But in any case, a pope can take any definitions of any council he wants. If it could be a local council, he could raise that. He could, he could give it to the authority of an ecumenical council. He would say, you have to accept these decrees as though they were given by an ecumenical council. Everything, everything runs on the pope. The pope doesn't have to, he doesn't have to have his decisions voted upon. He might, you know, he might take a, you know, in councils they talk about the you know, consultative votes, you know, talk about bishops taking votes on things. Those are, that's purely consultative. The pope could, the council, all the bishops could unanimously agree on something, and he could say, no, we're not defining that. Conversely, he could just take something that nobody's voted on and say, this is a definition, this is a dogma now. Yes? What was Francis uh, is it, Martin for? It's Henry II. Francis I is dead now. Oh, no, I mean the country of Oh, the country of France, yes. You know, just you know, leverage over the Holy See, wanting to reassert, uh, reassert those you know, whatever claims it had over uh, you know, the French court had over the you know, rights of the church. 
and also you know, it's, uh, rivalries with the with with Charles V, um, the, the emperor and king of Spain, also getting involved. So it's just ge general politics. So thir the thirteenth session of the council was opened on October eleventh, fifteen fifty one. The Council first promulgated the dogmatic decree on the Eucharist, in which the various systems of the, Lu of the Lutheran heresy on the presence of Jesus Christ, figuratively, fig figuratively and by impanation, and the sacrament of our altars were discussed and condemned. So that makes sense, Im impanation. <laughs> in other words, the consubstantiation, the idea that the presence of Christ is introduced into the bread and that they're simultaneously present together. So you have two substances with one set of accidents in the bread. That's what impanation is. In other words, in with panation. So the presence of Christ being like inserted into the bread, as it were. That was, that was Luther, consubstantiation. As Luther, whereas others can held to this idea that it was only figuratively the body of Christ. Yes. Yeah, that's Bergoglio. I'm not, I'm not sure what I'm not. So he's he's never very clear on his errors. Novus Ordo likes to come up with these really bizarre things. Like they said, of course, uh, Anglican orders are invalid. Pope Leo XIII uh, pretty very clearly declared that. But Novus Ordo a few years ago came out with this idea that they're no, they're partially valid. <laughs> Uh, they never explained what they meant by that. But partially valid. It's like being mean. But uh, they also they said there was some some time ago there was some idea of being floated that of course Nova Sardo hands out annulments like like baptism certificates. So they, there was some talk some time ago of saying that maybe some marriages are only partially valid. <laughs> and the reasoning was, well, you can have partial communion with the church, so <laughs> you can also have partially valid marriages. <laughs> but anything just goes to show that the that, that Novus Ordo ecclesiology makes no sense. Right. You know, is, stupidity and heresy are two things that go together. And you see, the ultimate, Bergoglio is the ultimate example of that. He <laughs> says so many stupid things that are also heretical. Anyway, uh, the, the Council of Trent, which was um, run by Catholics and whose decrees were approved by popes of the Catholic Church, uh, uh, you know, condemned those various Protestant systems, uh, decreeing that if anyone denieth that in the sacrament of the Most Holy Eucharist are contained truly, really, and substantially the body and blood, together with the soul and the divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ, and consequently the whole Christ, but saith that he is only therein as in a sign, or in figure, or in virtue, let him be anathema. So, could not be clearer if anyone saith that in the sacred and holy sacrament of the Eucharist, the substance of the bread and wine remains conjointly, with the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, and denieth that wonderful and singular conversion of the whole substance of the bread into the body, and of the whole substance of the wine into the blood, the species or appearance of the bread and wine remaining, which conversion the Catholic Church most aptly calls a transubstantiation, let him be anathema. Again, Exactly, just what comes right out of our catechism books today. Of course, they're probably not teaching the word anathema to <laughs> children about to receive First Communion, but the substance of it is there. If anyone saith that Christ, uh, given in the Eucharist, is eaten spiritually only, and not also sacramentally and really, let him be anathema. 
If anyone denieth that all and each of Christ's faithful of both sexes are bound, when they have attained the years of discretion, to communicate every year, at least at Easter, in accordance with the precept of Holy Mother Church, let him be anathema. So another reason this would not go over well today is that it says that there are only two sexes. That's exclusionary. And it says also, if anyone saith that faith alone is a sufficient preparation for receiving the sacrament of the Most Holy Eucharist, let him be anathema. And for fear lest so great a sacrament may be received unworthily, and so unto death and condemnation, this Holy Synod ordains and declares that sacramental confession, when a confessor can be had, is of necessity to be made beforehand by those whose conscience is burdened with mortal sin, how contrite even soever they may think themselves. So in other words, stating that what we know that by the law of the church, anyone who commits a mortal sin, even if he has made an act of perfect contrition and therefore been forgiven for it, still must receive sacramental absolution before receiving certainly the Holy Eucharist, but any of the sacraments of the living. Because in fact, when, to be, in order to be uh, pardoned by God for a, a, a mortal sin uh, through an act of perfect contrition outside of the sacrament of penance, it has to be with the intention of confessing that sin of submitting it to the Tribunal of Penance. That's, you'll see all of that in Moral Theology on the Sacraments, which I believe is being taught this year, although uh, the third volume of Merkelbach is so long, we split it up into two years. And as I recall, we sp when I took it anyway, we split it up in the middle of the Sacrament of Penance. So it's, um, you, you might see that this year if you're starting it this year, doing number three. But in any case, it's all there. So everything I tell you now, you'll see later. Yes. Some of it already? Okay. Yeah, penance is a long section in that book. <laughs> Probably 500 pages or something. That's a good chunk of the book. Maybe not quite that. That would be half of it, but it's a lot of it. Spend a long time on that. And also, you, you'll see that, of course, one mortal sin cannot be forgiven without all of them being forgiven. Even if somebody forgets one or more mortal sins in in the sacrament of penance, out of you know, not out of you know, not out of negligence, but after forgets them after a diligent examination of conscience, uh, of course they still have to be confessed. But you know, they're they're forgotten. They and they are validly absolved. They would have to be confessed later, but they are absolved because one mortal sin cannot be absolved without all of them. The same is not true of venial sins. But I'll let you talk about that in moral theology class. So those canons on the, con containing definitions on the Eucharist were followed by eight chapters on reform, so uh, disciplinary reform in the church, relating to the authority of bishops and the jurisdiction uh, over the clergy of their respective dioceses. So and we don't have to go through all of those in detail <laughs> as a more study of canon law. But we can go on now to the... 14th session, which was held on November 25th, 1551, which published the decrees and canons relating to the sacraments of penance and extreme unction. Uh, Luther's errors on these two sacraments were reduced to 16 articles, which were delivered for examination to different theologians. Their debates on the articles were presided over by the Bishop of Verona. So nine chapters were promulgated on the sacrament of penance, they establish its necessity, the divine origin of the institution, its character, its effects, the obligation of auricular confession, in other words, confession which the confessor can actually hear, uh, because it's not sufficient to simply uh, you know, drop a, a letter in the mailbox of a confessor and then he absolves you after that. Uh, you have to... Uh, uh, he can't send, like, say, a written uh, 
uh, absolution back. Although you do read about, uh, say, priests who were imprisoned in the gulag, that I mean, you can, um, uh, for example, a person could have a you know, written list of sins, but there are <laughs> stories of the different ways that they would have to uh, do confessions. <laughs> a little interesting, right? they'd have to just look like they were, uh, the, the priest was, of course, he was, in the, he was a prisoner himself, the one account I remember reading. Uh, he was a prisoner himself, and so he was just you know, wearing the same work clothes everyone else was wearing, but they would have to just be like, on their lunch break or something, just hear confessions without seeming to hear confessions. Or they just have to be like standing around, look like they're chatting, but it's actually doing a confession. <laughs> you know, lots of interesting ways they would do that. So sometimes, yeah, given difficult circumstances, you have to improvise, but uh, yeah, you, you can't uh, su submit a list of sins to a confessor and then have like a written, <laughs> a written absolution given back. And it has to be auricular because auris means ear <laughs> in Latin. <laughs> I assume everybody knows that, <laughs> but maybe not. At least everybody who's second year and up knows that. Anyway. Uh, they also uh, enumerate the qualities of contrition and satisfaction. Again, something else you'll see in moral theology. So in one of the canons was, uh, that they defined was, if anyone saith that in the Catholic Church, penance is not truly and properly a sacrament instituted by our Lord for reconciling the faithful unto God, as often as they fall into sin after baptism, let him be anathema. And also an interesting point on the the precept of the yearly confession, it's, it actually strictly applies only to those who are actually guilty of mortal sin. Uh, so you have to do a go to confession once a year if you are guilty of any mortal sin. But of course, devout people won't have any problem going to confession more than once a year. And of course, receiving the, the graces of the sacrament regularly, even without actually falling into any mortal sin, will of course give the graces to that will help you to avoid falling into mortal sins. Uh, and then another definition, if anyone saith that those words of the Savior, receive ye the Holy Ghost, whose sins you shall forgive, they are forgiven them, and whose sins you shall retain, they are retained, are not to be understood of the power of forgiving and of retaining sins in the sacrament of penance, as the Catholic Church has always from the beginning understood them, but rests them contrary to the institution of this sacrament, to the power of preaching the gospel, let him be anathema. So, anyone know that word rest, W-R-E-S-T? <laughs> to, to take it, like to, the idea is to violently seize something. And uh, in this case, to violently seize the, the true meaning of those words and apply them to something else. So... Con condemning uh, Protestant ideas that, oh, there's no such thing as um, auricular confession that's not necessary, that's, these words are only referring to the preaching of the gospel. That's false. So he says that also, if anyone denieth either that sacramental confession was instituted or is necessary for salvation of divine right, saith that the manner of confessing secretly to a priest alone which the church hath ever observed from the beginning, and doth observe, is not in conformity with the institution and command of Christ, and is a human invention, let him be anathema. And then, if anyone saith that in the sacrament of penance it is not necessary of divine right for the remission of sins, to confess all and each of the mortal sins, which after due and diligent examination are remembered, even those which are secret, and those which are opposed to the two last commandments of the Decalogue, let him be anathema. So we were just talking about this defining that it's necessary to confess all mortal sins. Of course, these definitions of this council would not have been the first time that people would have heard of these things. But as always, uh, heresies are the occasion of definitions like this. So if you also if you look at the history of the church, you can see uh, the, the declining intellectual capacity of people, <laughs> as it were. Because if you look at see, the earliest uh, the councils of the church, they're defining things concerning the Trinity. Uh, 
uh, concerning uh, processions in the Trinity and things like that. And now we are here in the 16th century and we're defining that you have to confess all mortal sins in confession. And by the time we get to the 19th century, the Vatican Council, there are definitions coming out that you can prove the existence of God from natural reason alone. <laughs> it just keeps going down and down. People need to be explained things more and more and more basically over time. Instead of the, you'd hope it to be the opposite, but it's not. <laughs> People get more stupid with time, not more intelligent. Or at least more errors arise that corrupt people's minds so badly that more and more basic things need to, uh, need to be you know, defined. That when you're, when you're essentially defining that God exists, uh, you know that we've got problems. So he's also, if anyone saith that bishops have not the, re the right of reserving certain particular cases to themselves, except as regards uh, external polities, so external matters, and that therefore the reservation of cases hinders not, but that a priest may absolve from reserved cases, let him be anathema. So apparently Protestants have also attacked the idea that, that the bishops can, or of course the Holy See, can reserve certain sins to be absolved. So, you know, reserve sin meaning that, say, just a, a simple confessor cannot, it does not have the jurisdiction to absolve sins of a certain type. Uh, one classic example is uh, sin, like the sin of uh, abortion that, that uh, uh, bears with it an excommunication that's reserved to the bishop of the diocese. So, if someone has an abortion, that person would have to go to the bishop of the diocese to be absolved for it. So, they're defining that, yes, that's well within the jurisdiction of the church to do that. It's not an abuse to do that. Yes? Well, it's, just, it's a sin of murder. It's, it's, a, it's a sin of murder. Of course, it's taking an, an innocent, not only an innocent life, but a life that can't even defend itself at all. So, I mean, it's certainly, it's, it certainly excites greater horror in that sense. So, it seemed, certainly it seemed to be considerably more grave. And also, uh, interesting stories, uh, and also Merkelbach talks about ways that, of course, the, the direct violation of the seal of confession would be to point out a person and say a sin that he confessed. That's the direct violation of the seal of confession. But there are other ways of indirectly violating it, in other words, by essentially giving clues, whether, direct, whether willingly or not, uh, that people could figure out who confessed what. And one example that Merkelbach gives of a way of doing that is if they have, say, in a church, they, and they have a list of the, like a plaque or something on the wall with reserved sins outside the confessional. So don't, you can't confess these sins here because they, we can't absolve them in this confessional. An example of, break, of violating the seal of confession directly would be if the confessor were to come out and look at that list and yes, point out which one, <laughs> or, or just look at it at all would be enough because it would mean that it's possible that whoever's in the confessional at that moment was confessing one of those. So in a, you would think that they would also put them on the inside of the confessional so that the, the confessor could still consult it without having to leave the confessional. But Merkelbach gives that as an example of a way that you could violate the seal of confession. So caution, extreme caution required when you become a confessor. Okay. And then, uh, so, if anyone saith that God always remits the whole punishment together with the guilt, and that the satisfaction of penitence is no other than the faith whereby they apprehend that Christ has satisfied for them, let him be anathema. So, of course, yes. Now, if, essentially, we have no choice but to absolve them. Uh, it's really, it's part of just the larger question of, uh, which is definitely outside the scope of our church history class, but uh, the question of how we can absolve validly today in any case, because ordinarily, to absolve any sin at all, uh, a confessor would need to be granted the faculties by the, the ordinary of the diocese. Uh, so in, in some cases, though, in the past, uh, it was given... Uh, all priests, and so at least in certain areas, uh, were given the faculties to absolve any sins. Like some, in some cases, there were uh, Eucharistic congresses were held, which were enormous events. Uh, cardinals would come to them, 
uh, and you'd have thousands of people showing up. And of course, many of them would be priests. They would have confessions being heard. Uh, in cases like that, sometimes uh, priests would be given the faculties to absolve any sin that might be heard in, uh, mentioned in confession, because you might say, because otherwise, you might, you know, someone might come from another country or even another continent. You want to say, no, you have to go back to your your home country or your uh, your home diocese in order to be absolved from that. <laughs> if they're at the Eucharist of Congress going to confession, uh, just have the uh, Priests there have the faculties, or at least on occasion were given the faculties to absolve from any sin they would hear in confession. Right, there, there are some sins that are reserved specifically to the Holy See to be uh, absolved, but you know, we're not going into that now. That's also for moral theology. Okay, so talking here about the, um, the remission of the guilt of the sin versus the remission of the punishment for it. Obviously, yes, when sin is forgiven, sin is absolved, there's still temporal punishment due to it, which has to be paid sooner or later, but uh, the council defining that uh, just because the sin has been validly absolved doesn't mean that the person does not have still some temporal punishment, uh, which is due to it. So also, if anyone says that to the satisfactions, I say also says that. Uh, also, if anyone's um, okay, if anyone says that to the satisfactions by which penitents redeem their sins uh, through Jesus Christ are not a worship of God, but traditions of men, which obscure the doctrine of grace, the true worship of God and to the benefit itself of the death of Christ, let him be anathema. So all this crystal clear. I mean, you could, this is practically the catechism right here. It could not be more explicit. And the canons relating to the sacrament of extreme unction are equally explicit. Uh, equally precise. Uh, if anyone saith that extreme unction is not truly and properly a sacrament, instituted by Christ our Lord and promulgated by the blessed apostle St. James, but is only a right received from the fathers or a human invention, let him be anathema. So yes, St. James in his epistle mentions extreme unction. Of course, he doesn't use the words extreme unction, but he describes it. Uh, he, des he describes the ceremony or describes the sacrament, the conferral of the sacrament. And also... Sometimes you might read in sacred scripture uh, accounts, say some of the some of the gospel accounts of the last of the Last Supper, or might or read Saint Paul making reference to it. And you might think well, that doesn't sound like the words of consecration exactly at mass. Uh, well, that's because this, the this, the sacred writers, the inspired writers, weren't necessarily intending to uh, transmit the exact sacramental form. It's more of a general sense of what's what is done at the mass. In fact, for a long time, uh, it was those things were kept secret. For, from catechumens, because for one thing, the Romans were accused, accused the early Christians of being cannibals, say that they're consuming flesh and blood at their meetings, they're accusing them of being cannibals. And also, interestingly, this is a little bit separate, but interesting also, interesting also, interestingly also accusing them of being atheists, because the Romans were polytheists, had many gods, and the Christians said, of course, Catholics saying there's only one god, they're saying, they're saying all the gods are false, therefore they're saying there are no gods, they're atheists. So, yes, the Romans accused early Catholics of being atheists. <laughs> yes? Mm. Mm. Yes, yeah, that, that was one of the reasons why, in, in the early centuries of the church, that e catechumens even were not instructed uh, to the exact nature of the, of the Mass until either they were baptized or very close to it. And that's also again one of the reasons why the canon, or there are other reasons, but one of the reasons why the canon of the Mass is done silently. And also the reasons why, uh, I think we've had it all this year, but uh, this, the, the general idea of the, there being a certain secret, discipline of the secret, it was called, disciplinum arcane. Uh, the, the, the general principle is the reason why, say, when we have the, uh, like the preaches, uh, during, say, during prime, you have the, or the Apostles' Creed even, uh, the, the celebrant intones the first few words and then it's done in silence. 
until the last few words, finishing the recitation. It was part of that, keeping, keeping the secret, the discipline of the secret. Again, the reason for those things was they didn't want catechumens, you know, especially new catechumens, to be, you know, oh, so there is actually cannibalism. <laughs> they, they, would, they, would not, they might not understand it until they were well enough instructed to understand all the transubstantiation and, and, and so forth. Uh, everything that was actually the case. They, might, they wouldn't understand that until they were about to be you know, either baptized or about to be baptized. And of course, one of the reasons why you know, we have the division, the mass of the catechumens and the mass of the faithful, the catechumens were, had, had to leave <laughs> at the offertory. So uh, then, if anyone saith that the sacred unction of the sick does not confer grace, nor remit sin, nor comfort the sick, but that now it should cease to be used because it was of old only the grace of working cures, let him be anathema. If anyone saith that the right and usage of extreme unction, which the Holy Roman Church observes, is repugnant to the sentiments of the blessed apostle St. James, and that it is therefore to be changed, and may without sin be contemned, so held, held in contempt, it's an older word, by Christians, let him be anathema. If anyone saith that the presbytery of the church, whom St. James exhorts to be brought to anoint the sick, and the description that St. James gives of the conferral of the sacrament, if these presbytery, if anyone says that these presbytery are not priests who have been ordained by a bishop, but the elders in each community, and that for this cause a priest alone is not the proper minister of extremunction, let him be anathema. So it's definitely St. James is definitely describing the sacrament of extremunction and not simply some kind of slathering oil on sick people that anybody can do. That's true. <coughs> and something interesting to keep in mind is that somebody who's you know, you've fallen unconscious, you know, unconscious, uh, unconscious can still be given the sacrament of extreme unction if he you know, give all the signs of you know, live, live a life as a good Catholic and everything, can still be given the sacrament even if uh, he's you know, has fallen unconscious and is in a coma and about to die. Because in order to receive a sacrament valley, the minister, of course, has to have at least the virtual intention of conferring the sacrament when he does. In other words, he's gonna be if he's distracted in the actual moment and doesn't even explicitly remember doing the act in the moment after the fact, uh, as long as he has that virtual intention, in other words, having posited the intention uh, that which, which flowed into the act in the moment and was never retracted, that's valid. For the, for the recipient, it's even less just to have a habitual intention of receiving it that doesn't even necessarily you know, affect the, the actual moment. It can still be validly received. Again, you'll see all of that <laughs> in moral theology. Uh, you probably, if you're seeing penance, you've probably seen extreme unction already. So, uh, yes? Hmm, okay. You said you said you were studying penance. Uh, okay, okay. Okay, okay. <laughs> anyway, yes, this is it. It's all, it's all in moral theology. Uh, if you don't believe me, look it up in Merkelbach. Uh, I'm not making any of this up. Uh, so yes, that that that's the reason. That's the explanation for why someone uh, someone in a coma can be you know, gi given extra function. But again, there has to be the reason. There ha there has to that that habitual intention does ha does in fact have to be there. So somebody who uh, you know, knew knew of the Catholic faith and rejected it his whole life could not be presumed to have that intention. So the principles are clear, but as is the case in moral theology, the application is the difficult part. And it could be very difficult in some complex cases. So there were also some decrees on disciplinary reformation, uh, which followed the dogmatic decisions as usual in the same session that to those who enter into holy orders, notwithstanding a prohibition, interdict, or suspension from the ordinary, shall suffer punishment. So in other words, if somebody's been prohibited from receiving holy orders, or is under interdict, in other words, not permitted to receive the sacraments or anything, or suspension from the ordinary, 
will suffer punishment if he receives holy orders laboring under any of those things. That bishops in partibus are forbidden to confer orders upon any cleric without the permission of his bishop. Does anyone know what that means, bishops in partibus? Anyone familiar with that? Yes. Yes, uh, bishops, it's called in partibus infidelium. That's what it, that's what it used to be called. So, and the idea being that if someone was going to be consecrated a bishop, would going to be given the power of orders of a bishop, but there was no plan to actually give that bishop any jurisdiction, like a, a diocesan jurisdiction, um, then he would be given a title of some diocese where you know, it's in the lands of the infidels and places where it would be impossible to operate jurisdiction in any case, and would be essentially allowed, you know, would be a bishop with a title, but not actual any jurisdiction, not, not any Episcopal jurisdiction, certainly. Now they're called titular bishops. Anyone heard that before? Heard of titular bishops? Right. At a certain point, there was, the decision was made to drop the, the use of the term in partibus in fidelium, and just instead to call them titular bishops. So again, the idea being that bishops without jurisdiction, you know, who are not, don't have any diocese of their own, at least not that they can operate, uh, cannot just go around uh, you know, ordaining priests uh, without the permission of the the bishop uh, who uh, who has jurisdiction over that over that cleric. It's really it's common sense, but it, clearly, if they're making decrees about this, then there were problems. <laughs> uh, so another decree that the bishop may suspend his clerics who have been improperly promoted by another if you find them incompetent. So <laughs> if you have somebody who uh, was promoted by a previous bishop and he, and he turns out to be no good at what he does, then you can get rid of him. There's no problem with that. Penalties are decreed against clerics who being in sacred orders or holding benefices do not wear dress beseeming their state. So if they don't wear the clerical garb they're supposed to wear, uh, they're going to be penalized for that. Though in canon law, there are actually there are, there are provisions that clerics had to always wear the tonsure, always wear the clerical tonsure visibly, but through custom that no longer applies. <laughs> Certainly not in the U.S., uh, many other places also. And they say also that voluntary homicides are never to be ordained. So if you murder somebody, you can't be ordained. <laughs> it's a good, good thing they specified that. All right, so all of these decrees being put out, and then Protestants begin to complain that the council had not awaited their arrival to promulgate its decrees. as if they would have accepted those condemnations <laughs> had they been there. Their complaints were examined in the 15th, 15th session, which was held on the 19th of March, 1551. It was agreed to accede to their wishes, in other words, to wait for them to be present before uh, further decrees. And the 16th session was prorogued to the 1st of May to give them time to repair to Trent. So prorogued means to be put on hold. So anybody else know another council that was prorogued? I've talked about it several times. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, it's still it's still on prorogue, as it were. Still on hold. Yes. It was it was prorogued to the first of May. Yes. So they put it on hold to give time for the Protestants to arrive. So they were also sent safe conduct, as explicit as they could have possibly asked for, to their deputies. So they would be allowed to come you know, without being killed or molested in any way. Uh, but the sequel was to prove their bad faith. So 
Uh, the council, I mean, everything's being done to accommodate them, but they're clearly you know, in bad faith based on what's happening now. So in the meantime, a Lutheran army had been threatening uh, the city of Innsbruck, which was not far from Trent. Some of the prelates, as a result, fled from Trent, because they deemed it unsafe with you know, a, a band of, of armed heretics nearby. That might not turn out well if they manage to get into a council of Catholic bishops, so some of them leave, uh, rather understandably, I would say. Uh, and in a consistory held on the 15th of April, 1552, uh, the Pope, learning that the city was not safe from the assaults of the heretics, forwarded the order for the suspension of the council. So, it's, okay, put everything on hold. We need to make sure nobody gets killed here. And the imperialists, in other words, the ministers of the emperor, oppose the execution of the order. They don't want the council to stop. So, you see, we have uh, royal interference here with the, with the pope's decrees. You know, double meaning, both <laughs> royal meaning uh, bad and also you know, ro royal to a great extent, and also royal <laughs> from monarchs. So, royal interference here. I've seen a lot of that. But the father is still remaining at Trent determined in a congregation held on the 24th of April to suspend the council for two years. So in, uh, in a session which was held on the 28th of April 15, of 1552, the decree for the conditional suspension was read and approved by all present except for 12 Spanish bishops who are, of course, uh, a lot more aligned with the Emperor Charles V who himself, the emperor, remained at Innsbruck in spite of the attempts made by the Protestants upon that city. So, uh, though he's not quite as strong, and he's been emperor for quite a while now, he's not quite as, as vigorous as he was when he was young. And our author says that even his powerful mind seemed to feel the effects of age. That by a blind presumption, he thought that he might without danger scatter his forces sending some into Italy against the French, others to Hungary to meet the Turks. And meanwhile, he's at a city which is being threatened by heretics. So he's displaying rather poor military judgment here. But the reason he felt confident enough to do that was a sense of security regarding the Protestants arising from the fact that he had loaded Maurice, who's the new elector of Saxony, remember, Frederick the Elector of Saxony had been defeated uh, and forced to abdicate uh, any claims to his, his domains, not for, both for himself and for his descendants. So Maurice uh, was re replaced him. Uh, he, had, he had loaded this particular elector with uh, favors, hoping to tie him to his interests by the ties of gratitude. But it didn't work. <laughs> This uh, ungrateful fellow was secretly betraying his benefactor, though he repeatedly professed that he was very gratefully uh, attached and submissive and everything to the emperor, and had already joined in a powerful league against him with other Protestant nobles of Germany and the king of France. So politics never ceasing to be involved here. So uh, in, during the night of the 22nd of May, 1552, it was announced to the emperor that Maurice was approaching Innsbruck at the head of all his forces. So, now we have uh, the elector of Saxony threatening the Council of Trent. Conferences were held at the city of Passau between the imperial ambassadors and the deputies of the Lutheran princes. Their negotiations resulted in an agreement known as the Treaty of the Public Peace. Uh, see, it was concluded in spite of the earnest and protested, uh, repeated protests of Pope Julius III, remember, he is the Pope currently, uh, who strongly objected to the conditions of the treaty. Yeah, we'll, we'll look at the conditions of the treaty next time.